Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you back to our uh, discussion on the tafsir of Surah Al-Furqan and Surah Al-Furqan is translated as the originator it is the 35th surah of the Quran in its uh, sequential order it is considered a relatively early surah in its uh, in, its, in terms of its the time of its revelation, it's a it's considered a mid a middle Meccan surah. It was revealed, you know, about five six years after the Ba'atha, roughly speaking. And we see that at this juncture in the in the Prophet's life, he's beginning to to face uh, a great amount of hostility from from the Meccans from Quraysh. So uh, we, we'll pick up where we left off. So we left off at verse number 25. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verses spoke about how every community was uh, received guidance, every ummah. You know, if we look at, you know, verse, verse 24, which was the verse that we spoke about. Uh, that we discussed last uh, in our last session. Inna arsalnaka bil bashiran wa nadira. O Muhammad, we sent you a- as a messenger in truth. We've sent you as a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner. Wa immin ummatin illa khala fiha nadir. And there has not been a single nation that that has that has gone without. A warner. A warner has been sent to every ummah, to every nation. And we've reached ayah number 25. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iyu kathibu kafaqad kathab al-ladheena min qablihim. Jaaatkum rusuluhum bil-bayyinati wa bil-zuburi wa bil-kitab al-munir. If they deny you, those before them also denied. Their messengers brought them clear proofs, scriptures, and the luminous book. This ayah, just like many verses in the Quran, and there are even entire chapters that were revealed primarily to console the Prophet. As I had indicated earlier, in the early Meccan period, when the Prophet first started to propagate his message, Quraysh, the Meccans, the the aristocrats, you know, the power brokers of Arabia, they didn't see this small religious movement as a threat to their uh, political and economic interests. They saw it as some small, you know, benign religious cult. And, of course, the Prophet for the first three years was privately inviting people to to Islam. And then after, in the fourth year, in the third and fourth year, he took the, the message to the public. And there were a handful of people who were joining the Prophet. But as, as the Prophet's numbers grew and as more and more influential people in Mecca joined the Prophet, it was seen as a movement that had the potential to jeopardize the social order in, uh, in Mecca. And this is where you see, you know, this is why I said that in the middle of the Meccan period is where you see that not only are the Muslims being verbally assaulted, but there's also physical violence that the Muslims are facing uh, at this time. And therefore you see that this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoles the Prophet that, you know, they, they call you a liar, a magician. You're facing this resistance from your people who are, who initially recognized you as a Sadiq al-Ameen. You know, it's, it's interesting that before he declares his nubuwa, all of the, the Arabs, they considered him to be the, the trustworthy the truthful, and ironically, even after 
even as they plotted to assassinate him, they all kept their valuables with the Prophet. They knew that, that this is a man who, who is incapable of treachery and betrayal. So even as they're trying to end his life, they, they, feel, they feel that their valuables are safe with the Prophet. But nonetheless, they ridicule him. They call him a false prophet. And of course, the prophet is a human being. You know, this is uh, emotionally hurtful. And the prophet knows that if they, if they assassinate his character, you know, it, it, it could dissuade people from coming towards the truth. So even his, his care for his own reputation is really rooted in, in, uh, in Islam itself because he's the spokesman of God and of the religion of God. So this verse on, on one hand consoles the prophet that you're not the first prophet to be opposed. You're not the first prophet or messenger who is facing pushback from his community. You're not the first prophet who is called a liar. Almost all the prophets, the overwhelming majority of the prophets that were sent to various nations, to various peoples, they were rejected, they were taunted, they were ridiculed. So what is the, the stress and the hardships that you're facing are not unique. History is repeating itself. And Allah reminds the Prophet in this verse that they're not rejecting you because, so their rejection of you is not because the message is unclear. It's not because you failed to articulate these teachings in a way that's understandable. Allah says they 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 are rejecting you in the same way that they rejected your predecessors and they're not rejecting you know it's one thing to deny something because it's ambiguous because it just doesn't make sense Allah says faqad kadhaba alladhina min qablihim the nations the people before you O rasulullah they also belied their prophets and their messengers and when did they belie them they were all given sufficient evidence in the form of bayinat. So here, that their messengers brought them clear proofs. Clear proofs here is a reference, according to many commentators, they say this is a reference to the miracles that that bear witness to the truthfulness of the the prophets because as we've mentioned time and time again to claim that you are appointed by god to claim that you are god's spokesman requires evidence because anyone can claim to be a prophet what distinguishes false prophets from true prophets is that a true prophet can produce a supernatural act that cannot be imitated, that is inimitable. So bayinat refers to these miracles. So, so, so Allah is reminding the Prophet that those who came before you, they rejected prophets even though they brought them miracles. So they brought mu'jizat. zuburi, Allah sent prophets, many of them, uh, they had scriptures. So here, I want to draw your attention to the last, the last part of the verse. So we mentioned bayinat means miracles that confirm the truthfulness of the claim of prophethood. وَبِالزُّبُرِ وَبِالْكِتَابِ munir. So in addition to miracles, the prophets also provide guidance. And here, zubur here is the plural of zabur. Now zabur, we, of, we, we often associate it with the Psalms of David, which was a scripture given to Dawood. But here, Zabur, it means all of the scriptures that were given to uh, prophets. And then, وَبِالْكِتَابِ الْمُنِيرِ And the luminous book. 
Now, the question here is, what is the difference between scriptures and the luminous book? So if, if scriptures are books that were given to prophets, what is this luminous book? So what is the difference between Zubur and Al-Kitab Al-Munir? Alama Tawatabai in Tafsir Al-Mizan, he says, he explains that Zubur, it means scriptures. And this refers to the divine scriptures that were revealed to various prophets that speak of God and they, they provide, you know, moral guidance and so on and so forth. So Dawood's book is Zabur. And perhaps other prophets. There were many prophets who received uh, scriptures. While the luminous book, Al-Kitab Al-Munir, refers to a special category of scriptures. And these are the scriptures that are more comprehensive. And they include legal injunctions such as the scriptures that were given to, to Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and our prophet. So basically, these are the scriptures that contain legal instructions. And these five messengers are known for introducing new sacred laws that abrogated the sacred laws of their predecessors. So Zubur refer to the scriptures that don't contain legal injunctions. They contain passages about God. They speak about, you know, ethical issues, supplications, and so on and so forth. Al-Kitab al-Munir, the luminous book, are those revelations, those scriptures, which are more holistic. So all scriptures are sources of light. So it's not that only what was revealed to these five messengers are, are uh, books of light. All of the scriptures that were revealed to prophets are sources of light. They're sources of guidance. They are revelations that illuminate the human soul. However, these books, meaning the books that were given to Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and the prophet, these books are singled out. They are known as Al-Kitab Al-Munir because of their holistic scope because books that offer you the, the the legal code of conduct are going to provide guidance uh, in all spheres of human life now this narration this this explanation by Allama Tabatabai is is actually based on some traditions that we have from the Ahlul Bayt so there's a tradition by uh, Abil Jaurud, he's a companion of Imam al-Baqir, and he asks him about, uh, about this verse and the difference between Zubur and Al-Kitab al-Munir, scriptures and the, the luminous book. So Imam al-Baqir says, Hiya kutub al-anbiya bin nubuwa that the scriptures are the books of the prophets with prophethood, meaning that this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave certain scriptures uh, to prophets. والكتاب المنير and the luminous book are what? It is the permissible and the prohibitions, the halal and the haram. So الكتاب المنير, the luminous books, are those special category of scriptures that contain divine laws, that contain sharias. And because they are comprehensive and they're holistic in their, uh, in their scope, Allah describes them as Al-Kitab Al-Munir, right? As, as luminous books because they're, uh, they're more holistic. So we come to verse uh, number 26. فَكَانَ then I seized those who disbelieved. And I, I would say that maybe a better translation is, uh, you know, those who rejected. Because there are some who don't believe, but they, the truth has not reached them for them to reject it. So then I seized those who disbelieved. And how terrible was my 
reproach. Now, when Allah says that He seizes them, that He seized the those who rejected the truth after knowing the truth, because iman is really a two it's it's a two step process. Iman, you know, unlike you know what we see in in the English language where faith where faith is defined as, you know, to believe in something despite, uh, despite lack of evidence. In, in the Islamic tradition, Iman is to know the truth and to submit to the truth, to accept the truth. And those are two separate exercises, two separate uh, issues. So it's possible for you to know something, but to reject it, you know, for, you know, the example that I often give is that, you know, you might know that there is a dead body, that there's a dead body. But just because you know that this is a dead body and this dead body cannot cause you any harm, you're not going to sleep in the same room as a dead body. Because you, you don't, you have, you don't, even though you know it, your heart hasn't accepted that reality. So Iman is is the to know the truth and to accept it. And kufr is to know the truth and to reject it. So Allah says, Thumma kafru. Then I seized those who disbelieved. And how terrible was my reproach. So seizing the disbelievers indicates that they are they are being punished. And and oftentimes the, the punishment for rejecting the truth occurs in this earthly life, even before the hereafter. And the expression, kafaru, when Allah says, I, then I seized those who disbelieved, it also conveys this, this element of surprise, that this is something that took the kuffar by surprise. You know, they they felt as though they had time and they would continue to live, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seizes them and he he strikes them as they merrily indulge in the pleasures of this world. And you find that there are actually verses in the Quran that speak about people who feel secure from God's punishment. And in many of our previous lectures, we spoke about the importance of, of balancing, you know, striking a balance between hope in God's mercy and fear of his punishment. You know, the, the heart of a mu'min should contain hope and fear. So it's it's a sin. We know that it's that aliyas min rahmatillah that losing hope in God's mercy is a major sin. That's a sin. So to lose hope is is problematic. It's a it's a cardinal sin. And on the other side of the spectrum, to have so much hope that you feel that God is not going to punish you, nor is He going to hold you accountable. This is also another sin. So in the same way that it's a sin to despair of God's mercy, it's a sin to feel secure from his punishment. So both are problematic. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes people who feel that no matter what I do, God's not going to punish me. Whether that that whether that comes from just not believing in a higher power or believing that that he's so merciful that he's going to forgive me this is also haram to assume that god is not going to punish you for your transgressions is uh, is is just as much as a sin as the one who despairs of his mercy so if we look at surah al-a'raf surah 7 ayah 98 aw amina ahlul qura or did the people of the cities feel secure from our punishment coming to them in the morning while they are at play? So feeling, so Allah admonishes 
people for feeling secure, feeling as though that there's no higher power that is observing them. So we have to have this balance between fear of God and, and hope in him. Verse number 27. أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ ثَمَرَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُهَا وَمِنَ الْجِبَالِ جُدَدٌ بِيضٌ وَحُمْرٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهَا وَغَرَابِيبُ سُودٌ Have you not considered that God sends down water from the sky and through it brings forth fruits of diverse colors. And in the mountains are streaks of white and red of diverse hues and others pitch black. Now, how do we understand this verse in the context of the verses that came before? The previous verses, you know, like verse 24 mentioned there has not been a single nation who did not have a warner, a divinely appointed warner. So the previous verses spoke of the sending of prophets to all nations. And these prophets, they were equipped with, with miracles, with scriptures. And these scriptures ultimately... The purpose of these scriptures is to invite people to forge a relationship with their creator. You know, this is essentially what the prophets, the main objective of Nubu'ah is. To connect people to their creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is showing us that that we have it in us, that if we just, it's because we're so distracted by dunya that, that God, the existence of God is, is the most obvious thing. That if we just took a moment and reflected, the problem is we're, we're distracted. We're constantly distracted. Allah says, have you not considered, just, Allah says, just think about if you want to connect to your creator. Just reflect. Just think about something as simple as water falling from the... Think about rain and how this clear liquid, this clear liquid, this tasteless liquid falls from the sky upon the earth. And then from the earth, you see that this water is able to give life, to give vegetative life, and you see that colorful, diverse fruits and foods emerge from the earth. Allah says, you don't reflect on that? Do you think that this is just a product of chance? Don't you see that this is, this is the engineering of a supreme intelligence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exercises absolute control that it's not just the water falls and there's just one color as if it's just some fixed law Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates and he brings forth fruits of diverse colors you know it's really amazing we take it for granted but water is clear and it falls on the soil and then from the earth you have you know, yellow bananas, you have red apples, you have, you have all of these fruits and vegetables, so colorful, so aesthetically pleasing. And then Allah speaks about the beauty of, of the mountains. You know, if I show you a portrait of the sunset, and I show you a portrait of a mountain, we know, even if you've never seen the artist, you know that this portrait has an artist. You wouldn't believe it if someone told you that, you know, this, you know, there was a piece of paper that was blowing in the wind and it just fell on the ground. And then, you know, with the passing of time and the wind and the dirt, it, it 
you know, this, this design formed as a result. You know, when you, look, when you look at a painting, you know that there's too much detail for it to be the product of chance. So we're invited to reflect and to connect to our creator by pondering over the beauty of his creation, the, the wondrous creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 28. And of mankind, beasts and cattle, there are likewise those of diverse colors. So Allah spoke about the, the diverse colors of, of fruits. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this same diversity is, is, has, been, has been built into human beings, to animals, to cattle. So this diversity is, is Allah's policy in creation. That this diversity is, is visible. We can witness it. In the, veg in the world of vegetation, we can see it in the animal kingdom, and we can even see it among human beings. So end of mankind, beasts and cattle, there are likewise those of diverse colors, yet only those among his servants who know fear God. Truly God is mighty and forgiving. So this verse refers to the, different, the, the, the differentiation between races and ethnic, ethnicities. Because Allah says that in the same way that fruits come in diverse colors, that human beings also are diverse in their colors, in their races, in their ethnic, ethnicities. And this diversity is seen in the animal kingdom. It's seen you know, in wildlife, in, in, the, in domesticated animals and some have some scholars have also said that in addition to the physical diversity in human beings and we know that people come in different shapes different sizes different colors they speak different languages so we know that there is physical diversity uh, in human beings but more importantly is that some scholars have said that this could also be a reference to the way in which the inner states of human beings differ. So we differ in our physical, in our physical forms, but we also differ in our, our inner states. So our faces are different and our hearts are also different. You know, you, you're, you're not going to find two people who are exactly identical in every way physically. It's impossible. And, and similarly, even spiritually, there's no such thing as two individuals who are exactly the same in, in spiritual terms. There is going to be uh, some differences. So in addition to the, to the physical diversity in human beings, this verse can also be understood as a reference to the way in which the inner states of human beings differ. And we know that the, the spiritual differences are even greater than the physical differences. Because if you look at human beings, yeah, we have, you know, our skin colors may be different, our eye color, our hair, our, our, our heights, we're different. But we all look human. We all look human. But in Alam al Akhirah, we have many ahadith that indicate that people are resurrected based on the reality of their inner states. Meaning that your, your heart, your spiritual image will dictate what your physical image will look like on, on that day. And that's why we have many ahadith that speak of people who will be resurrected as different animals, meaning that not everyone will retain their human form in the hereafter, that 
that you're lucky that we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that, that he resurrects us as human beings. Because many people, they look human, but they did not behave like true human beings. And as a result, they will be resurrected based on their spiritual realities. Now, the end of the verse here says, That God is only truly feared by those who know, by those who have, have knowledge. Now, what does this mean? I'll read the the uh, the narration in Arabic and then I'll uh, I'll read the translation. An Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. The tradition is from Imam al Sadiq. Fi qawlillahi azza wa jal inna ma yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al ulama. The Imam he 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 made a comment about God's statement, the ayah of the Quran, where Allah says, "Only those servants of God fear Him who have knowledge of His greatness." Imam al Sadiq he says, by those who have knowledge of his greatness, he means those whose actions confirm their words. So if someone's actions don't confirm their words, if someone does not act on their knowledge, Imam al-Sadiq says that they're not considered knowledgeable in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in this sense. So those whose actions do not confirm their words are not knowledgeable of his greatness. So, so really someone, a person who who sins is not considered someone who has true knowledge of, of God's greatness. And, and I'll give you an example as to why this is true. If, if you are in the presence of another human being, when you're in the presence of another person, you know, it's, it's part of our fitrah. That when, when we're in the presence of others, we are much more cautious about our appearance. We, we, we give more consideration to our appearance and our appearances and our conduct. When people are alone, they're a lot more relaxed about the way that they look and about the way that they behave. But if there, if suddenly there's even a stranger walks in the room, you see that people are gonna they're gonna adapt because there's a living, breathing person who is in the same room. Now, when we, when we stand before Allah Azza wa Jal every day, and we say that you know Malik we 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 address Allah as being Rabbul Alameen. The reality is that if if we sin, if we defy God, if we disobey Him, we've actually made Him the most insignificant observer, because there are things that that we do in private with Allah that we wouldn't do, especially if we sin in private, many of us would avoid committing sins in public because we're embarrassed of, of others. This, and, there, and there's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq about this, that means you that, that we have made Allah the most insignificant observer. So those whose actions do not confirm their words are not knowledgeable of his greatness. They really don't know and they haven't understood. Now, even though... You know, they might have knowledge of the mind, but that knowledge has not been accepted by the heart. All right, so we, we spoke about the idea of having iman, and iman is to know and to accept. Some of us, we know that God is great, but that, that knowledge is very superficial, and it's just the knowledge of the mind. It's not uh, the knowledge of the heart. And, and I actually, I spoke about this in detail uh, during the first... Ten nights of Muharram when I spoke about the uh, the hadith of Unwan al Basri, so you can you know refer to those lectures if you want a more in depth uh, discussion. So how do we understand this verse in the context uh, of uh, of the verses that come before it? 
So from the context of verses 27 and 28, we can infer that the word ulama, because it's very tempting to look at this, to look at this verse and say that God is only feared by scholars, by ulama. Now, what is the meaning of ulama here? Are we are we referring to to scholars who are experts in fiqh and in theology? No. We can infer that the word ulama is used not in the sense of scholars, but in the sense of those who have knowledge, and in particular those who have knowledge of God's greatness. So someone might be not might not be a scholar in the technical sense. You know, they've never been to an Islamic seminary. They're not experts in jurisprudence or theology. But they have knowledge of God's greatness. And they've, they, they've acquired this knowledge of God's greatness because they reflect and they contemplate the wonders of God's creation. I mean, just if you just look up at the sky at night and assuming that there's very little light pollution, you know, I promise you, if you look up at the sky, it's breathtaking. I mean, to imagine that these are stars that that are millions and millions of light years away, and many of those stars have, have already died, and their light has just reached the earth. It's very humbling. You know, you will be, in some cases, you might even be reduced to tears when you just gaze at Allah's creation. And you look at how vast this universe universe is and to know that the one who created this entire universe didn't forget about you and he sent you prophets he sent you messengers he this same creator the the one who created the tree that's outside of your house the one who created those those distant stars and those distant galaxies that same lord who seems so distant has personally invited you and I to have a private audience with him five times a day. I mean, it's it's really amazing. So those who have knowledge of God's greatness are not necessarily scholars. You can acquire this knowledge by pondering, by engaging in, in tafakkur. So verse 28, you know, ibadhi it mentions that the fear of God is a natural result of knowledge of God's greatness. When you understand how supreme and how powerful and how knowledge and how transcendent the creator is, the natural result of that, that knowledge is, is fear of God, but not f- the fear that we have of, of tyrants and, and despots. We're talking about a fear that is really a sort of reverence, you know, to be in awe of him and to feel that you're so unworthy of his attention and his love and his care. And you feel honored to be his servant. You feel honored that you're his creature and you are afraid of severing and damaging that unique relationship with him. And of course, Imam al-Sadiq adds that, adds that an additional result of knowledge of God's greatness is that our actions, uh, is, is for our actions to confirm our words. And I'll just share just a couple of ahadith about the importance of seeking knowledge. Because unfortunately, you know, we live, especially in the the Muslim community, and particularly in the Shia community, most of us, unfortunately, not you know, not those who are attending, you know, these classes. I, I wish you know more, more people had weekly tafsir uh, classes. But generally, people might go and listen to some majalis during Muharram, and maybe a few majalis in the month of Ramadan, and that's the extent of it. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, but the majority of, of Shias, that's the extent of their knowledge. They'll go and listen to a cut, but there's so there's no real program for for gaining Islamic knowledge. And but you'll see when it comes to 
you know, other issues when it comes to, you know, you know, getting the best deals and, and making, making, make sure you get that contract uh, signed, they're on top of things. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, لَوْ عَلِمَ النَّاسُ مَا فِي طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ لَطَلَبُوهُ وَلَوْ بِسَفْكِ الْمُهَجْ وَخَوْضِ الْلُجَجْ If people knew the benefits of seeking knowledge, and here seeking knowledge is referring to Islamic knowledge, the knowledge that brings you closer to your creator, they would seek it, even if they had to shed blood, or dive into the deepest seas. Meaning that if we only understood the value of having this ma'rifah of Allah, Imam al-Sadiq says that you would be willing to go to the ends of the earth. You would be willing to endure physical harm. You would be willing to put yourself in danger. You would dive into the deepest seas. You know, if you tell people today, that if you go to the most remote villages of India or China, and if you go, guaranteed you will get $10 billion. Forget $10 billion. People will go for $1 million, even less. They'll do it. Because they see value. Because they understand that this has value. Having a relation, knowing the creator of the universe having an intimate knowledge of the creator of the universe has so much value that Imam Sadiq says that if you only knew the value of seeking knowledge, you would be willing to shed your blood and you would be willing to go and dive into the deepest seas. And some of us would do that for our children. We, because our children are precious to us. If your child was in the middle of the ocean, believe me, you would go into the middle, middle of the ocean. You would dive into the deep into the seas to rescue your child. You would jeopardize your own life to protect your child. Why? Why would you why would you do that? Because you love your child, because you because your child is very precious to you. Isn't Allah the most precious thing to us? If Allah is truly the most precious, and he should be, because everything that we love, including our, our children, belong to him. It's all him. He put that love that we have in our hearts towards our children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, this parental love that we all marvel at, this is Allah. This is love that Allah placed into the hearts of the parents. It's not an accident. So imagine what we should be willing to endure to get to know him who is the source of love who is the source of peace and everything that he commands us to do is for our benefit you know allah doesn't gain anything if we know him or if we draw close to him the, we are the pri we are the only the sole beneficiaries and just one more hadith from the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa about the merits of of seeking knowledge, you know, to be a talibul ilm. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, it is attributed to him that he said, inna talib al-ilmi layastaghfiru lahu kullu shay. Verily everything seeks forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge. Hatta hitanu al-bahar wa hawamu al-ard wa sibaa'u al-barri wa an'amu. Everything seeks forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge. So you see that from an Islamic perspective, you know, Islamic ontology teaches us that everything has awareness, everything praises and glorifies God in their own unique way. And not only does everything praise and glorify Allah, but everything also does istighfar. It seeks forgiveness for the one who seeks knowledge of their creator. What an honor. You know, everything, even the inanimate objects, the, 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 you know, the, the, the fish in the sea, the reptiles on the land, and the predator, the, all of these creatures, they seek forgiveness on behalf of the, the seeker 
of knowledge. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes you and I among tulabul uh, ilm. Verse number 29. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَ يَرْجُونَ تِجَارَةً لَنْ تَبُورَ Truly those who recite the book of God, perform the prayer, and spend from that which we have provided them secretly and openly, hope for a commerce that will never perish. Now, according to some scholars like Fakhru Razi, he has an interesting insight here that I think is worth sharing. He says that when you look at this ayah, Allah mentions three things. And by the way, in the in the previous verse, Allah speaks about you know those who fear Him, and we understand you know in the min ulama that God is only feared by those who have knowledge, but Fearing God and having knowledge are not just theoretical concepts. You know, you can't just say that I, I have fear of God in my heart or I have knowledge of God. Having fear of God and having knowledge of God has to translate into action in the form of, you know, if God is dear to you, if you fear him, if you have reverence for God, then you should be connected to his book. You should establish prayer. You should give of what he has provided you because Allah has encouraged you to give so you can detach your heart from dunya because attachment to this worldly life is the greatest barrier between you and your creator. So Fakhr razi he mentions that the mention of the three together, you know, Tilawatul Kitab, Iqamatul Salah, and giving in charity, these three things. He says the mention of the three together may be understood as an allusion to worshipping with one's tongue, because you're reciting the book of God, worshipping with one's body, because you're praying, and prayer engages the entire body, because it, it it's comprised of standing and bowing and prostrating, and expending one's wealth. While the reference to fearing God in the previous verse, in the alludes to rem- remembering God's with one's heart. Because khashya is, is a fear of God that we feel in the heart. And if someone has true fear of God in their heart, worship should manifest on the tongue by reciting what Allah has revealed. The body should be engaged in ibadah. And of course, you should... Uh, you should expend of your wealth. And the injunction to spend of one's wealth secretly and openly. Because Allah says, وَأَنْفَقُ مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيًا So Allah praises those who give wealth in secret and in public. It's possible to give wealth publicly and still earn the pleasure of Allah. You know, we often associate doing good deeds in public as being Contradictory to sincerity. So the injunction to spend of one's wealth secretly and openly indicates that one should give both openly so that others are encouraged. Because I mean, imagine people only prayed in private and people only gave charity in private. We need reminders, public reminders of God. You know, this is why. This is one of the reasons perhaps why Salatul Jama'a was legislated. Congregational prayer is public prayer. Salatul Jumu'a, Friday prayer, Hajj is the most public form of worship. So when it comes to certain acts of worship, Islam wants it to be in the public sphere because it serves as a reminder. It serves as a, as a reminder that people need to be reminded of God, to be reminded of the transient nature of this life. They need to be reminded that our relationship with God is at the center of who we are and every other relationship is based on our relationship with God. So so giving charity in, in public is not always negative. Sometimes it's necessary to create a culture of giving, to motivate and encourage others to give. And of course, giving charity and privately has 
has more thawab, generally speaking, because it, it ensures sincerity, that there's no audience, there's no crowd, and therefore when you give in secret, it's, uh, it's a sign that this was truly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is a, a verse, you know, because the verse said that those who give in, in, in secret and openly, they hope, they have hope in a tijara, in a business, in a commerce that will never perish. Because when you give charity, you're, you're, you're engaging in a transaction with the Lord of the worlds. Allah says, Man hasanan. Who is it that would loan God a beautiful loan? Now here, when you look at this verse, Allah says, Wa mimma And they spend from that which we have provided. So everything that we have is originally, it, it belongs to Allah. But look at this, this ayah where Allah is essentially asking us to give him a loan. We say, Ilahi, it all be, we belong to you, let alone our wealth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, is speaking to us in a very loving way, in the way that, you know, in the way that parents sometimes speak to their children, you know, children, you know, they kind of, they, they end up saving some birthday money or they get some Eid money. And, uh, and especially if the parents are the ones who give them, parents worry that their kids are going to squander their money. So the parent, even though the money is theirs, they gave the kid the allowance, the, their child the allowance. They say, Baba, give me a loan. The parent doesn't need the money. But the parent takes the loan so they can preserve it for the child. So when they get older, they have money for, for college. They have money to purchase a car and so on and so forth. So Allah does the same thing with us. Allah has given us all the money, but he asks us for a loan, not because he needs it. So he can preserve it for our akhirah. Why does Allah want a loan from, from you? so that he may multiply it for him many times over. And then ayah number 30, and, and we'll conclude here. That he may pay them their reward in full and increase them from his bounty. Truly he is forgiving and thankful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to this verse, he will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala done and increase it to an extent that they could not fathom. So Allah doesn't just reward us in full for what we've done. Allah is kareem. Allah is generous. Allah gives us more than, than we deserve. So Allah gives us from his fadl. So he gives us extra because of his generosity. And the reason why he rewards us, it's not because we deserve. In fact, most of us deserve to be punished, not to be rewarded. And that's why Allah says, innahu ghafurun. He's forgiving. Allah pardoned you for many of your sins. He forgave you. And sometimes, you know, on the day of judgment, many of us may have not even repented, but Allah, out of His mercy, He'll pardon and He'll forgive. And He's shakur. Allah is thankful. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he appreciates the good that we do. Meaning He doesn't treat everyone equally. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes. He appreciates those who do good. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to give everyone the same reward, that's, that wouldn't appreciate, that wouldn't be appreciation of the, the efforts of those who did more. So Allah is shakur. Allah values what we do. Allah values what we do so much so that in Surah Al-Zalzala, what does Allah say? فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى If you do an atom's worth of good, Allah keeps track of it. You know, people might forget the little things that you do, the, the small acts of kindness and courtesy, but Allah doesn't. Allah takes 
account of all of the little, and sometimes we even forget, you know, maybe we forgot about that, that phone call that we made to a friend who was feeling depressed and you, you cheered them up. You know, maybe we forgot that, you know, when we went to the shopping center, we held, we held the door or we, we gave a shopping cart to an elderly woman or to a, a single mother. We don't remember these things, but a lot, a lot takes this all to account because he's Shakur. Allah is thankful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates all of the little things that we do, especially if they're done with, with sincerity. And that's why Allah, in the, when he speaks about Jannah, he says, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا They will have whatever they wish in paradise. وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيد And with us is even more. Meaning Allah says, I will give them even more than they wish. Because you can only wish for something that you can comprehend. And in paradise, there are many things that our minds cannot even grasp. And I'll conclude with this final hadith and we'll end. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam speaking about the lowest level in Jannah. Inna adna ahl al-jannati manzilan Law nazala bih thakalan al-jinn wal-ins Law wasi'ahum ta'aman wa sharaban this is mentioned in Bihar al-Anwar. Imam al-Sadiq says, for the one who occupies the lowest station in paradise, were he, the humans, were all human beings and all jinn to visit him, to appear as his guests, nothing would diminish from him if he were to provide them all with food and drink. Meaning that the lowest person in Jannah will be given such an estate and so many provisions that he would be able to host all human beings and all jinn without diminishing anything of what he has. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among the inhabitants of paradise uh, through the shafa'a of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ajjal fajram Any questions or comments? Assalamu alaikum There's a live question uh, he's, a person asks I truly believe that what grow, goes around comes back to you Is this the fear of Allah? I mean it doesn't necessarily mean that someone fears fears God because you know this idea of karma you know exists even in, in certain traditions where they don't even believe in a higher power. But if uh, but if someone concedes and affirms a belief in God and a belief in God's justice and a belief that he holds that he's just and he will hold transgressors accountable, whether in this life and the hereafter. So if that is the thought process, then, then yes, this is, this is a fear of God. But to just be afraid that something is going to come back to haunt you because there is some mysterious you know, uh, law known as you know, uh, you know, karma, then that, that wouldn't constitute fear of God. So God has to be a part of the equation. Thank you. And uh, earlier we talked about how Kufr is knowing the truth, rejecting it, and then there's Iman is knowing the truth and accepting it. Is there uh, another concept around not knowing the, the truth, but accepting it, kind of accepting a truth without really having a good reason to? Yeah, so, so believing in something without evidence. Uh, so not knowing, being ignorant, but just believing in something in a, in a very dogmatic way is also problematic. You know, there are some scholars, you know, so for example, if someone believes that the Quran is the word of God, but they're not able to articulate a single logical reason. They're not able to articulate a single logical reason. And nor do they have any rational reason for believing that the Quran is the word of God. They just say, I believe. Why do you believe? I don't know. I believe. This belief might not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so that's why the theologians, they say that you have to at least have some 
evidence. It could be even a simple uh, argument. You know, for example, there, there's the narration where the prophet, he asks an old woman, you know, uh, why she believes in God or how she came to believe in God. And she was, you know, an old illiterate woman. And she had a, she was spinning a, a, uh, a wheel. And, uh, you know, she either it was some type of mill of some sort. And she said to the prophet, she, she believes in God. Why does she believe in God? She says that when it comes to this wheel, if it only moves, if I move it, if I remove my hand, it stops. And she says that when I look at the, the heavens and the earth and the constellations of the heavens and the movement of all these celestial bodies, it's impossible that they're all moving without a mover. That's a very simplistic proof for the existence of God. But the point is that she had a proof. She had some rational argument for the existence of God. So to believe in something without any evidence is uh, is problematic. It, 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 it potentially may not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're always asked to have evidence. Because if you know if if you have this habit of believing in things without knowledge and without evidence, who's to say that it's not going to lead you to accept something that's false? So that's why you know this is why it's important for us to to use our intellects to be people of reason and understanding. So so that's also problematic to believe in something with with no absolutely no evidence. And uh, the hadith of the prophet were every talking about how everything seeks the for, seeks forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge including fish, reptiles, predators and livestock. Is that hadith uh, is it supposed to be about uh, how the person pondering over those creatures uh, gets closer to God, or is it is it a different meaning that that's trying to imply? It seems that you know, talabul ilm to seek knowledge is more than just reflecting. You know, because because it this is called the the seeker of knowledge. You know, and that's different from tafakkur. You know, seeking knowledge in the ahadith refer to seeking knowledge that that helps us know God that helps us you know build a a solid belief system and it's also the knowledge that allows us to know our legal duty before God so so someone who just ponders over God's creation but does not know what the law of God is uh, in 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 the situations in his life a person who doesn't know their legal duty for those situations that are relevant to his life is not would not be considered a seeker of knowledge. So the seeker of knowledge is someone who who puts in the effort to know what they believe and why, and to also know what their legal duty before God is with respect to ritual worship, with, with, with respect to you know how what what does Islam say about financial transactions? What does Islam say about all of the rules that that make up the uh, the Islamic legal system. 